script, nondescript. Digital technologies have the potential to liberate design from the strictures of the past and from those of present day economic and production realities, but they also have a propensity to favour a Fordian, highly rational approach to designing and making the built environment. The former tendency allies itself to a humanistic, egocentric world of design with individually authored works, whereas the latter lends itself to the efficiencies of BIM technologies, harnessing the power of individuals, architects, economists, fabricators, quantity surveyors and so on, to work collaboratively, ending up with buildings that may look bland and uninspiring. Where does this leave us and what does this suggest about our digital design future? The answer is not binary, if you'll excuse the pun, and indeed the history of architecture and indeed of technology teaches us that periodic turns in human technologies have had ambiguous effects on cultural expression. Gutenberg's printing press was certainly the precursor to the spread of the Renaissance and later of the Enlightenment, but whether it had such a marked effect on particular cultural forms is moot. The sonnet certainly became popularised in English as a consequence of its derivation from the Petrarchan model stemming from continental Europe and its dissemination in print, but is this the sole reason for its popularity in late 16th century England? This paper takes its cue from Mario Carpo's book The Second Digital Turn uh, in 1917, 2017 and enlarges on the dichotomies of liberal invention and post-Fordian economies suggested by him. It looks in particular at technical and technological invention half a century ago, at the peak of Harold Wilson's white heat of technology speech of 1964. Then, as now, there were conflicting and polarised views of architectural invention, production and authorship, with lessons for us today. The architectural press, which is the organisation, the architectural press, was for much of the post-war period the architectural publisher, the architectural publisher um, predominant in the UK. It dominated the market in Britain, but also worldwide throughout the Commonwealth. Its weekly trade rag, the Architects' Journal, had a massive circulation and an unrivalled reach and authority. I subscribed to the journal together with, with its illustrious sister monthly, the Architectural Review, as soon as I became a first year student of architecture back in the 1970s, and my subscription has never lapsed. There they sit on my straining shelves, their dead load testing the limits of medium density fibreboard, living proof of the merits of the empirical, scientific basis, so typical of much of the reporting in its pages. This study is historical and frankly nostalgic for the halcyon days of a publishing phenomenon that not merely reported but led the profession. Its accounts of architecture were eagerly awaited every week, and its building studies, in-depth reporting of the latest buildings, soon became widely admired, its subjects often emulated so that they became instant precedents. The journal was highly influential amongst practitioners, it goes without saying, but also amongst government agencies, client bodies, engineers, quantity surveyors, particularly QSs, thanks to the elemental cost breakdowns pioneered by the journal and of course students. But this is not simply an account of a successful publishing venture. The story spans a period of British history from the slow emergence of the consumer society emerging from the austerity of the post-war years to the never had it so good era of Harold Macmillan to another Harold, Wilson, and his white heat of the technological revolution of the 1960s through to the gloom of the 1970s and the three-day week before arriving at the polarising tendencies of Margaret Thatcher's 1980s. Many of the architectural themes tracking these social and political phenomena are well known. The festival of Britain's style of lightweight exuberance, the heft of brutalism, the intricacies of high tech and the rise of the neo-vernacular, all are charted in the pages of the AJ. But with this study I'd like to rise above style and consider more overarching themes. These are, broadly, architectural meta-concerns of the technocratic and a zeitgeisty sense of, for want of a better word, I shall call the social humanist. The former encapsulates an oftentimes managerial attitude to facts, costs, indeed all things measurable, and goes hand in hand with the rise of the anonymous architectural practice, the name of which 
is frequently a concatenation of initials, BVP, AHMM, and so on. The latter is the particular province of the incommensurate and intangible. However, the two themes do indeed come together in the pages of the AHA, with the rise of the accountancy attitude, one that posits that all aspects of humanity, poverty, social aspiration, community cohesion and so on, are in the end as measurable as year values, bending moments and sound attenuation. Building science in the sense of German Wissenschaften, in fact. From the 1930s, when the Architectural Press, or AP, was founded, it has served as de facto house publisher to the UK architectural profession. Its two main publications, the Monthly Architectural Review and the Weekly AHA, have served, respectively, the aesthetic and technical needs of architects for just over short of a century. Rival publishing houses began to challenge its hegemony later in the 20th century, and today, with the rise of the internet, it is more often than not accessed digitally, but faces a plethora of competitive information and critical resources. The AP also had a buoyant book publishing arm, with a glittering array of renowned writers producing world-class textbook and critical publications. One of the early features of the AHA that was introduced in the 1930s was the publication of a weekly series of information sheets on matters technical, construction and design. These looked the part. The clear drawings were printed white on black and looked like the kind of blueprints produced commercially in the interwar and postwar periods. Occasionally, there would be short articles of a technical nature published in the AR, but it was primarily the AJ that carried the technical baton for the profession. The AJ began to function as a kind of architectural academy in the 1950s, as an aspect of its developing missionary zeal to foster a progressive spirit in architecture. It saw itself as the handmaiden of a profession that, in its estimation, needed to be brought into firmly, firmly into the middle of the 20th century in terms of its professional standing with regards to its clients, its sociological concerns in respect of a wider society and the scientific and technological basis of modern construction. In many respects, it mirrored the developments in the architectural profession outlined just before, while prefiguring the academic turn of UK architectural training as codified by the Oxford Conference of 1958. Although the fellowships were short-lived, with few fellows appointed, they nonetheless served to move the journal into its authoritative, respected role as learned mouthpiece of the profession, a mouthpiece informed by scientific and rational principles, and not merely the accumulated traditions of amateur enthusiasts, which had hitherto been the hallmarks of British architectural journalism. The fellowships were the idea of Hubert de Cronin, H.D.C., Hastings, the chairman of the architectural press, who saw them as a vehicle to lend the journal just this authority, as their findings would be published in its pages. Of course, this was not mere altruism on Hastings' part. The prestige accruing to the AJ would help bolster its sales and, furthermore, might well lead in due course to further publications by the AP. But this was all in the future. There were to be in total five recipients of the fellowship from 1956 until 1962. The general theme was the organisation of architectural information. They were each remarkable men, collectively making extraordinary contributions to architectural and general culture. They were Michael Ventris, Darwin Bullivant, Geoffrey Hutton, Michael Rostrum and Leslie Fairweather. Michael Ventris, uh, born 1922, died in 1956, was the initial fellow, and indeed the one who attracted the greatest fame. This was, however, not due to his work in architecture. Ventris was the polyglot son of a Polish-Jewish mother and British father, with an interest in architecture sparked by the sculptor Naum Gubbel. His architectural studies were interrupted by the war, but in 1948 he graduated from the Architecture Association London. His early architectural practice was in school design, and with his architect wife Lewis, he designed their modernist house in Hampstead, London. His lasting fame, however, rests on his work in deciphering the Linear B script, with the revelation that it was a form of ancient Greek. This work, drawing on that of archaeologist, archaeologist Alice Kober, Carl Blagan and Alison Franz, led to Ventris eventually deciphering Linear B, 
for which he was awarded an OBE in 1955. Ventris's philological background and code-breaking nous, his duties with the RAF were supposed to have led to secret intelligence work in Germany immediately after the war, sparked in the young architect a fascination with the classification of architectural knowledge which led to his winning the fellowship. He died tragically before any of his work could be realised in a collision with a stationary lorry on the Barnet Bypass, just to the north of London. At the end of the Second World War, the architectural press and its staple monthly and weekly, weekly magazines, the AR and the HA, returned to London, to Queen Anne's Gate, Westminster. Richards soon appointed Colin Boyne as AJ editor, and then Lance Wright as its technical editor. Richards had published one book immediately after the war, The Castles on the Ground, The Anatomy of Suburbia, in 1946, twelve years later, The Functional Tradition in Early Industrial Buildings. While his earlier book, An Introduction to Modern Architecture, presented a more or less orthodox view of architectural modernism, akin to Nicholas Persson's views, as disseminated in his book Pioneers of Modern Design, these three subsequent publications, as it were, bookended the architectural press's post-war endeavours to present a very British version of architectural modernism. This is one that located the human user at its heart, whilst acknowledging a technical, even technocratic approach that would enable such an architecture to flourish and to be made available to the greatest number of people. Following Michael Ventris's untimely death, successors to the post of AJ Research Fellowship were appointed. The aforementioned Darden Bullivant, Geoffrey Hutton and Michael Rostrum jointly, and finally Leslie Fairweather. Their contributions led to the AJ being regarded as authoritative in UK practice for the integration of technological information and the design process. The AJ Information Library throughout the 1960s and 70s represented a significant development of its information sheets from the 1930s into a systematic approach to building information management avant la lettre. That Michael Ventris was one of those who cracked Linear B should not make us think that this outstanding creativity in one field should necessarily be replicated in another. This of course goes to the heart of how we regard creativity in design. The Ventris House, uh, completed after his death in 1959, designed by Ventris with his wife Lois, is ordinary in the sense that Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown were described to straightforward, no-nonsense design of the 1960s and 70s. It looks like a house, so to speak, to an even greater extent than a rather similar, but more knowing one in Watford, designed by Alison and Peter Smithson in 1956 for the acoustician Derek Sugden and his wife Jean. The Ventris House to cite Country Life magazine, with its, quote, excellence of its finishing materials, the fastidiousness of its detailing, and the carefulness of its planning, combined to make it more worth study than many flashier buildings, end quote. Both houses could be said to be advertisements for particular building materials and products. Crittle steel frame windows, polyvinyl floor tiles, Benham's underfloor heating, and so on. You might argue that these small houses are modest and inexpensive essays in a self-deprecating architecture mode, unrepresentative of more prestigious commissions, private and public. Yet I would counter that any scrutiny of the architectural press of the day reveals a preponderance of projects that appear to be the outcome of a kit of parts mentality, as if their architects had just emerged from the nursery, still constructing model buildings from proprietary kits. Let us look in random at the outpoint of a commercial practice, GMW, note that concatenation of initials again. Its most famous building of the 50s was a podium and slab office block on the Marlborough Road, London, later to become Castrol House. This homage to SOM's Lever House, New York City, naturalised this North American typology, while at the same time extolling the virtues of curtain walling, of single glazing and green spandrel panels. Even in buildings that had a spiritual purpose, such as churches, the spirit of materials seemed to have greater significance than any genius loci. The architect Robert Maguire had designed perhaps the greatest Church of England liturgical reform church at St Paul's Bow Common in London, while still acting as building's editor for the AJ. It has a floor of proprietary square concrete slabs, 
a corona hanging above the altar fabricated of standard overlapping rolled steel sections and above all the standard ubiquitous compressed straw roofing panels exposed to view. This was J. M. Richards's functional tradition redux and rethought for the middle of the 20th century. Its sentiment would be echoed a few years later by the soon-to-be Prime Minister Harold Wilson when he gave his stirring white heat speech to the Labour Party conference in Scarborough in 1963. Maybe this was why he indeed did become Prime Minister by a narrow electoral margin. He appeared to have a vision, even though the never-had-it-so-good economy heralded by Harold Macmillan was a slogan from 1957 belonging to the governing Tory party. Quote, the Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this technological revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated methods on either side of industry. And again, in a rather chilling passage, perhaps, we can now set a programme controlled machine tool line so that, without the intervention of any human agency, it can produce a new set of machine tools in its own image. And when machine tools have acquired, as they now have, the faculty of unassisted reproduction, you have reached a point of no return, where if man is not going to assert his control over machines, the machines are going to assert their control over man. So said Harold Wilson. This paper takes its cue from Mario Carpa's book, The Second Digital Turn, and enlarges on the dichotomies of liberal intervention and post fordian economies suggested by him. It looks in particular at technical and technological invention half a century ago, at the peak of Harold Wilson's white heat of technology speech of 1964. Then, as now, there were conflicting and polarised views of architectural invention, production and authorship with lessons for us today. It began by looking at the remarkable, quixotic but ultimately tragic figure of Michael Ventris and his fascination for pattern and code in human civilization. His unanswered question remains to this day, could there be a code for writing buildings? His was a line of inquiry taken up by his successors to the AJA Research Fellowship with interim outcomes published in the journal. Such was the near monopoly the architectural press had on the UK profession that its quantitative approach to architectural production tended to trump the qualitative efforts of other voices from the same publishing house. However, it is significant that the penchant for a rules-based architecture could be found in a number of other places at the time, to name but a few here. In children's conceptions of design practice, as charted by Brenda and Robert Vale in their book Architecture on the Carpet, and in what some would come to regard as the pseudo-scientific approach of Christopher Alexander. This is very much a work in progress. My plan was to have spent one day a week from springtime onwards at the RABA, London, RABA Library in London, perusing the bound copies of the AJ and piecing together the story I've outlined in greater detail. Alas, this was not to be given the circumstances, but I'm hopeful of picking up the reins continuing once a degree of normality returns. So I hope uh, you have borne with me and I apologise for the lack of illustrations at which I simply couldn't get hold of for this talk. Thank you very much.